This episode of New Politics was released on the 26th of November, 2022, and produced on the land of the Wangal and Wajuk people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, big business wants to go to war with the Labor government on industrial relations, the media misbehaviour continues in the Victoria election, and we provide an update on the cases against the whistleblowers David McBride and Richard Boyle. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, Matthew Guy's debating coach. And David, we should mention that we've got our new book coming out soon, and the title is Diary of an Election Victory, and that's a wrap-up of all the issues of the 2022 election campaign, and we're in the final stages of production. We've almost put away the crayons, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, and spell-checking and all that sort of thing, and I think it's a pretty good read, David. Going through the, the proofs, it's amazing what a remarkable year last year was, and I'd forgotten some of it, or at least had filed some of it away in my memory. Some of it I remembered and some of it I couldn't believe happened at all. But it makes for a fascinating read. And the other thing too is that in retrospect it was clear that there was going to be a a wipeout. But only in retrospect. During that time, you know, you can hear us worry about, well, maybe these guys might get returned or the situation isn't going to change very much. And what will that mean for the future of Labor? What will it mean for the future of the Liberal Party? It's a really fascinating year to go back on. And if I was a younger man, I'd probably write another book on it. (laughs) So the book is coming out in a couple of weeks time and we'll give you all of the details once they become available. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription. But whether it's a subscription or if you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a T-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. Industrial Relations is once again in the spotlight with the mining industry and Qantas joining the coalition in their attacks on the Labor government's proposed legislation which will help to increase wages, reduce the gender pay gap, encourage flexible working arrangements and allow workers from different companies to collectively negotiate pay rises. And the big sticking points for these large companies is that issue of workers from different companies to collectively negotiate pay rises. And we've pointed this out before on New Politics. This is the reason why the Labor Party exists, to improve working conditions and increase wages for workers and strike that balance between the needs of workers and the needs of business. But it seems that business just wants everything on its own terms. Hancock Corporation, that's a company owned by Gina Reinhart, they've argued that they want to be excluded from this collective negotiation for wage increases, but the profits for Hancock Corporation in 2021, it was $7.3 billion dollars, For BHP, it was $15.5 billion, and for Fortescue Metals, that's owned by Andrew Forrest, their profit was $14.3 billion. Qantas has reported that its profit for the first half of the 2023 year is going to be around $1.4 billion. So these are high profits and record profits for the mining industry and large businesses at a time of stagnant wage growth. So I think that it's hard for these companies to argue against wage growth for workers when they're achieving sky-high profits. Unfortunately, it's not surprising. And of course, mining is really dangerous. It's extremely hard work. Any one miner has worked 25 times harder than Gina Reinhart, Andrew Forrest, or the board of BHP has ever worked in their lives. And they'll tell me how hard they work. But sitting and attending meetings and making decisions doesn't have the physical effect that the hard work of mining has. Miners deserve more. I know they get paid a really good wicket. And I know a lot of miners are very happy with what they're getting paid. I don't think many of them are going to say, oh, no, I I don't need any more or even give me a pay cut. (laughs) But those profits are obscene in a time of growing inflation and stagnant wages. Each of them could probably invest one or two billion dollars into increased wages. They're still making, well, what, 6.3, 14.5 and 13.3 13.3 billion dollars doesn't make a lot of difference at, at that level that's more money than most of us will ever see 
in 20 lifetimes. I think we're also getting a better idea of where Gina Reinhart stands on all of this, and that's if there was any doubt about it at all. But she was actually in the United States last week at the launch of Donald Trump's candidacy for the 2024 US presidential campaign, and she's also a member of the official Trumpette group, and that's a key supporter group of Donald Trump. So she's got enough profit to engage in that sort of rubbish, but not wage rises for employees in Australia. And she's primarily engaged in an ideological war about this, and she's always complained that wages are too high in Australia and said that we should be more like African nations that pay their workers $2 per day. And this is how people like Gina Reinhart make their obscene levels of wealth, where too much is just never enough. And during 2020, Gina Reinhart's personal wealth, it increased by $700 per second for every second of that entire year. And it went up to $21 billion. And We can have that argument about entrepreneurs making as much money as possible. That's what their role is. And as as long as it's within the law, that's all okay. But this is a really obscene level of wealth. And what makes it even more obscene is that these are the same people that are arguing against wage increases for workers. It's never, or maybe we're paying our executives too much. And studies have shown that the more you pay your CEO, the worse your company does. There's no value for money in paying multi-million dollar and tens of millions of dollars to a CEO that you're better to pay your CEO a bit less. It's pure greed. How much more money after the first, you know, billion, (laughs) how much more money do you need? And I know that a lot of our listeners are now going to shout lesser figures, 100 million, 20 million. I'm not arguing with you about that. I certainly don't begrudge people doing well for themselves and doing well at their business. I really don't begrudge that. But I don't know that these massive profits over the last five years or so are doing any good for anybody. The Labor government is making some overtures to Senators David Pocock and Senator Jackie Lambie, and that's to offer more rights to the ACT and more funding for Tasmania. And assuming that Labor has got the support of the Australian Greens for their proposed legislation, they do need the further support from either David Pocock or Jackie Lambie to have their legislation passed. And Senator Pocock, he suggested that the bill should be split and leaving the single interest stream out and debating that next year. As far as I can tell, it seems that David Pocock is learning the art of deal making and negotiating with the government. The single interest stream, that's an important part of the bill for the Labor government, and that's a bargaining process that will give support for low-income workers in different companies but working within the same industry. And it's probably a case where both of these parties are still trying to work out how they can work with each other in the future. And we also have to remember that because David Pocock is a senator from a territory rather than a state, his term expires at the next election. So he can't really afford to be too obstructionist or be too painful for the Labor government during this term because he might not get re-elected again. Yeah. The other thing, and I... I think I've been implying this, at least if I haven't said it out, is that a lot of the independents do tend to the right rather than the left. And that's okay. They were all fairly upfront about this. Some people chose to ignore it. Some people missed it. Some people refused to believe it. And of course, a lot of people were just happy that they weren't as far right as the liberal candidates who they knocked out. Nearly all knocked out liberal candidates. Pocock is a bit hard to judge because we haven't seen enough of his work yet. He's only a new senator. Let's let's be fair to him. Hopefully he will come in with some kind of deal that allows the less well-off in society to do a bit better and genuinely not, oh, we're cutting taxes at the higher end and that means the money will trickle down in 3042 AD. The really difficult one is Jackie Lambie, who I still believe she is actually trying to do her best, but has never quite seemed to get a grasp on how the Senate works, how her job as a senator works, or even what a consistent policy line is. While it's easy to say about David Pocock, well, this is his first term. We've got to let him learn the ropes and learn how the Senate works and learn how the committees work and learn how you can negotiate deals that everybody's pretty happy with and how you make that seem like it was a total victory for you and what etc etc Jackie's seemingly already gone through this 
where we'll end up with Jackie Lambie having a vote is really anybody's guess. Well, we also have to remember that it's either David Pocock or Jackie Lambie that the Labor government needs to get the vote from. And of course, based on the assumption that the Australian Greens will support the legislation. But that's the legislative process and that will go through the process that it needs to go through. It will either be passed by the end of this year or it will be split and we'll debate the other part of it next year. But I think we're also seeing the true nature of big business in Australia. As profit-based companies, it's their job to make money and ethics don't really have much to do with it. And I think that's where governments do need to step in, especially a Labor government. But there are massive profits that are being made by big business at the moment. And they're also threatening to use some of those profits to run an advertising campaign against these industrial relations changes and also if there's any proposal for a super profits tax. So we've got a situation where big business is prepared to go to war over changes that could increase wages at a time when big business is making massive profits. And they weren't actually opposed to receiving massive job keeper support from the government during the pandemic, and they were happy to keep the money, even though in most cases they didn't actually need it. And this cushion of support, and gladly accepted by business at the time, that has acted as a platform for these profits. And we also have to remember that many workers during the pandemic, they worked overtime, they were underpaid, just so that many of these businesses could survive. And now that they're surviving, it's time to repay that support. And I think that the Labor government should be using all of these arguments to stand their ground, push forward with this and push as hard as possible. Yeah, we remember back to the Rudd years where the mining industry did this massive ad campaign and Rudd folds. I know that if he was here, he would deny that he folded, but it was probably the great strategic blunder of his prime ministership. He then crumbles in the face of a really just a media campaign that he could have ignored or he could have met with his own funding, with government messages showing the dangers of climate change, with party messages, with going out and using his own formidable talent of one person at a time, meeting people, talking to people and winning them over. Kevin Rudd was probably one of the very best Prime Ministers at that, just meeting people. Bob Hawke being another one, John Howard being another one. But it's a skill that he didn't really utilise. I don't think it would be in Anthony Albanese's interests to fold against another media campaign. And really, I don't think another media campaign would work because, oh, we're not going to put up wages. For the vast majority of people who are watching, who want wages, you've got to have pretty strong arguments to not put them on. Those arguments aren't, well, we only earned $7 billion last year. They're not, uh, we can't run a mining industry. And when you get into, again, to the constitutional technicalities, the mining firms don't own the land and they don't own the product. That is all owned by the Australian government and the Australian government leases it out to the mining companies. And I know that these things aren't as simple as sometimes we make them sound, but I wonder if they said, well, okay, sure, we're putting up, we're paying, we want you to pay a much fairer licensing system and we're going to tax you much more on what is essentially our, and by our, I mean the Commonwealth, which is everyone listening, our resources, because even if Fortescue and BHP and Hancock say, well, we're leaving, even if they do, you'll get other people in who will be happy to pay the tax and who'll be happy to pay the licensing fees. Again, the government, I think, will hopefully realise it's in a position of strength. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud and Amazon Music or find us at newpolitics.com.au and you can also donate to New Politics through Patreon. And please share, comment or add a review. It helps other listeners find our podcast. Just sit there on your ass And look that funky chain dance Brother, sister, shoot your best We don't need this fascist crew thing Brothers, sisters We don't need that fascist crew thing Brothers, sisters We don't need that fascist crew thing This 
history will repeat itself. Crisis point when in the hour. Down the force will do no good. But you as I feel your power. It's the weekend of the Victoria election and we think that it's one of the most important state elections for some time. Not so much about the result, but the behaviour of the Liberal Party and the mainstream media. And if we look back at the 2018 Victoria election, it was almost the same behaviour. The Age and the Herald Sun were most vocal in their opposition to the Victoria Labor government. The Liberal Party, supported by their federal counterparts at the time, they brought up all of these issues of terrorism and race baiting, claiming that African gangs were taking over the city of Melbourne and hardline Islam had terrorist cells operating in the western suburbs. And for all of these efforts by the Liberal Party and the media in 2018, the Victoria Labor government increased their majority and had a 5.3% swing towards them. African gangs seemed to disappear after that and were never talked about again. Not to be outdone, the media has gone even harder this time around with a three-year anti-Daniel Andrews campaign that commenced during the pandemic with all of their anti-lockdown stories interviewing cafe owners, gym owners and pub owners about how unfair all of this was. And now they're filling up the campaign with as much hate and as much bile as possible. We've had members of Parliament openly calling for the execution of Daniel Andrews and a wide range of QAnon extremists and neo-Nazis encouraged by the Liberal Party and the media. David, you and I are based in Sydney, so we haven't been able to see all of this close up, but we've just never seen anything like this in an election campaign before. Not even the inept and corrupt Morrison government was this bad. Western Australia was fairly wacky, but not that wacky. South Australia and Tasmania were pretty normal. Queensland came from a low bar anyway, and they had all kinds of internal issues. So any of the wackiness never really made the news because they were sacking their leaders weeks before an election and things like that. It's quite bizarre that one Matthew Guy, whose probity can be questioned, you know, he's the famous lobster with a mobster, where he was talking to the head of an organised crime family about property development. Lobster with a Mobster came out of a New York headline, actually, where a similar thing happened with local politicians in the state of New York. But it was just as opposite here in this case. They dump him and then they bring him back, where he hasn't come back a reformed character. There's been lots of reports on the infiltration of the Liberal Party by particular religious sects that want to take over the government by any means possible which Morrison is a part of that movement. Now, we saw what happened federally. We saw what happened in Western Australia. Well, they've only got two seats in Western Australia. Is that right? That's right, yes. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and the rest of it's National Party, giving them a total of six seats. And now Victoria is a bigger state, and the, you know, but all indications will suggest that it's going to be another wipeout for the Liberal Party. And for those honest and committed and passionate members of the Liberal Party who genuinely want to see a better Australia for all Australians. And please stop yelling at the speakers, everybody else. They do exist. (laughs) We don't have to agree with them, but there are genuine members. And these are the people I'm always in, will always defend. Those who joined a party that has been torn away from them and made into something else. We don't have to agree with the party that was torn away from them either, but we do want parties that reflect in some way Australian values. And I know that's a loaded term, but I think our listeners know what I mean by that. (laughs) Well, my main issue isn't so much the behaviour of the Liberal Party, although that's been highly problematic. It's the influence of the mainstream Mm. media. and And that's where I was going. They're being supported in this. They're being presented as reasonable members of parliament. Oh, well, that's absolutely right. But the influence of the mainstream media in politics, I think it has been waning over the past five or six years. And Mm. during this time, they've been attacking every state Labor government incessantly, yet they've made little difference to the end result. They actively campaign against WA Labor in 2017 and 2021, against Queensland Labor in 2020, against Victoria Labor in 2018. And Labor easily won all of those state elections. And it was the same story again in the 2022 federal election. And Labor won that election as well. So at least in those elections, the act of campaigning by the mainstream media against the Labor Party didn't make any difference. But this time around in Melbourne, it's gone into overdrive. And 
Victoria is the heartland of the Liberal Party. It's the home of Robert Menzies. Peter Costello is from Melbourne and he's the chair of Nine Media. Rupert Murdoch is from Melbourne. It's also the home of the Institute of Public Affairs. So if the Liberal Party can't have the federal government, it needs to have the Victoria government as a consolation. And if the Liberal Party loses government in New South Wales in March 2023, which is very likely, we can see that this election in Victoria is a very important one for the Liberal Party. And if they don't win this and lose New South Wales as well, the only government that they will hold is in Tasmania. And sorry to all of our friends in Tasmania, but that's not very much for a mainstream party to hold. One government out of nine and the smallest state in Australia as well. And the Liberal Party also lost heartland seats in the federal election in Victoria this year. So This is one part that they're also trying to avoid. So this is a bigger election than your usual state election. It's the Liberal Party that has got so much to lose in Victoria. Mm. In 2007, 2008, Campbell Newman was the highest ranking Liberal as Lord Mayor of Brisbane. Western Australia had a credible, at least in numbers, opposition. New South Wales had a credible, at least in numbers, opposition. Queensland had a credible opposition. Western Australia no longer has a credible opposition, just numerically. We don't even need to get into policy. South Australia has a, wasn't the, quite the wipeout that it was in other states in South Australia. Now, New South Wales, of course, has Dominic Perrottet, and it's not looking good for them. And if the report on Gladys Berejiklian comes out, that will reduce their chances further. But the media, instead of saying there is no opposition... We have in Victoria a man so corrupt that he was a laughing stock. We have clear evidence of Liberal Party branches being taken over by fringe radical groups, bringing in debates that have never really been debates here, but fit into that far right Trumpist feeling, abortion, gun rights. It was a Liberal Party who controlled guns here in a, in a significant and real way, the Howard government. They don't care about that type of legacy. It's the one thing the Howard government did that the left will say, much as I hate him, he did that right. And they want to take all that away without really giving any reason as to why you'd want to force abortions underground, endangering women and children, why you'd want assault weapons to be happily on sale or or easily on sale in Australia. I note that some of the media outlets in Victoria are walking away from the violence. When Catherine Cummings said she wanted to see Dan Andrews as a pink mist, this is seriously unhinged. Yeah, disagree with him all you like. And for whatever valid or invalid reason you like, sure, and argue. That's the process. Andrews can handle it. He's big enough to handle it. And they tried to say, oh, her remarks were taken out of context. So the full context was printed. And it was even worse. It was clear that she wanted to see him pretty much assassinated. Even if inside she didn't want that, that's where the words that came out. So I think at this point, the media has to be held to account. Neil Mitchell has tried to distance himself from a lot of his. Now in New South Wales, of course, we had the lovely figure of Alan Jones who basically provoked the Cronulla riots in 2005. It hasn't gone that far in Victoria yet, thank goodness. But it's not far from it. And we've always been strong critics of the mainstream media in the past at New Politics, and it's a little bit of a sport for us, but they've moved quite dramatically from reporting the news to the role of right-wing propagandists. And some of our critics will suggest, well, that's just a lame assessment of the media just because you don't agree with what they're saying. And that's absolutely true. We don't agree with what they're saying because a lot of it is either made up or it's usually the one conservative perspective that favours the Liberal Party. And they're trying to influence election outcomes, which is not the role of the news outlet, And that's specifically the Herald Sun, the Age, the Australian and the ABC has now joined into the act as well. And just last weekend, we had an episode of The Insiders on the ABC where there were three political journalists, two based in Melbourne, who couldn't explain what the election issues were in Victoria and couldn't understand very much about the election. Let me turn to uh, the, the, the election campaign in Victoria, Anarchy, because you're up to your neck in this uh, at the moment. Six days to go. What is this election about? Uh, it's hard to know. It, look, it, it's one of the na- like, you know, nasty streaks we've seen come out during it. It's quite a mm. bitter campaign, uh, which is interesting because there's not a lot of big 
policy areas. There is the, you know, um, two dollar public transport and SEC, and there's sort of these things around the area. But in terms of like, um, I guess, a big vision, it, it's it, it's sort of lacking that. Now I don't know if it's because we've had a federal election this year, or because we had the federal budget a bit later. But it, it seemed to take a while to, I guess, gain momentum. Um, I think it's been really brutal. There's been a lot of personal yeah, and I politics. Yeah, I want to come to that. But it, I think is this, um, in, in large part, about Dan Andrews? Is it a referendum on Dan Andrews? There is an element which um, they saw with, uh, I guess, Bill Shorten when people said, I want to vote Labor, but I'm not 100% sold on Bill Shorten, and it ultimately cost them the election. Now, I don't think it's at that level, but um, it does seem to be working. I think even people that are pro-Labor and, and, and do want to support Labor um, uh, might not be, you know, I guess... Um, we do have this thing in Australia where we just get sick of pe seeing people, and in some ways the Daily Dan press conferences, I think people want politicians out of their lives a little bit, and he did become one of the most recognisable faces um, and polarising. You know, some people were very pro uh, his approach, um, but a lot of people weren't. I think this is a very depressing campaign. Andrews deserves to lose. Guy certainly doesn't deserve to mm. win. Um, I think two very quick points I'd make to you. One is, I don't think state politics now has the resonance in people's lives, and that's sort of bad for democracy. Because, I mean, I'm a political journalist, I live in Melbourne, I could barely tell you another opposition front bencher other than <laughs> Matthew Guy. And for the first time in my life, I'm attempted to scrawl on the ballot paper, none of the above. <laughs> so we've got journalists who are happy to announce that they don't know anything about their field that they're reporting on and very happy to display their ignorance. But they then go on to say that Daniel Andrews doesn't deserve to be re-elected. We're not told why, just some vague stuff about lockdown, supposed corruption, even though none has been found. And that's not to say that there isn't any corruption in Victoria, but you better substantiate those claims if you've got claims against the Premier of Victoria. And the media now reports things that just don't happen. We have a senior journalist for The Age, James Masola, writing an entire article about how it's really problematic that Prime Minister Anthony Albanese hasn't campaigned with Daniel Andrews and suggesting that he hasn't done this because Daniel Andrews is damaged goods politically only for social media to then light up with all the photos of Anthony Albanese and Daniel Andrews campaigning in the Victoria election. And this particular incident, well, that's just a small issue, but it's just so indicative of the media behaviour. If something doesn't fit your agenda or the agenda of your proprietors, well, you just make it up. People will run with it. They'll believe it way before the truth catches up with it. And it's just not a sign of a very professional media. No, and... They're private companies, so they can have whatever views they like. But it is possible to run a fair assessment of campaigns, even if you want one side over the other to win. Victorians are well aware how bad the lockdowns were for them. They're also well aware that Victoria has a much lower infection rate and a much lower death rate than other neighbouring states. Well, it's also an interesting comparison between New South Wales and Victoria, where the media is totally supportive of the New South Wales government and the Liberal Premier, Dominic Perrottet. Victoria has the best performing economy over the past year. GDP grew by 5.6 in Victoria compared to just 1.8 in New South Wales. The unemployment rate has been consistently lower in Victoria over the past three years in comparison. Victoria had the best levels of primary and secondary education between 2019 and 2021, coming in second behind WA in 2022. Hospitals have been an issue in Victoria, but the health system is still ranked better than the system in New South Wales. Victoria also has got a far more ambitious infrastructure program than New South Wales. Sydney had more lockdowns than Melbourne and a far more draconian lockdowns as well. But it's the Victoria government that gets all the negative news and is the one that supposedly deserves to lose office, whereas the New South Wales government smells of roses. And this has just been a consistent message over the past three years during the pandemic. The governments of Queensland, Victoria and Western Australia, they were the ones to cop all the heat from News Corporation, Nine Media and the ABC. Yet the New South Wales government was immune from all the criticism, even though they were the ones that did the most damage. Again, it's the figures and Victorians are aware of the figures. 120,000 people left New South Wales this year, which we may never get back. We have a health minister who doesn't understand health at all and doesn't, and worse, doesn't want to understand health in New South Wales. We have this soft media that will praise a discredited and corrupt premier as a poor woman who just happened to pick a, a bad boyfriend. That's the first 5% of the story. There's still another 95% to go. 
Why don't we look at that in a bit more depth? To read the mainstream media in Victoria, you would think that Daniel Andrews is one more corrupt than the Godfather, (laughs) and in fact is the Godfather, in the pocket of every foreign government in the world that's not to Australia's advantage, China, Russia, every African nation that's not well regarded for their honesty, etc., every South American, even though the Victorian government doesn't do a lot of overseas trade. There's another thing. As far as I know, there aren't any dodgy jobs given to people in Victoria like there was in New South Wales. It's a weird thing. that, And I know that you've got your side, but surely there must come a point where you think, yeah, we need to really rebuild this. Let them lose the election and then go around and find good, decent candidates with good, decent policies. Well, irrespective of the election result in Victoria, and Labor is still favoured to win this election, although there is always a slim chance of an upset victory by the coalition, I still think that there needs to be a national inquiry into the media after their totally unhinged and unbalanced reporting. And it's just not journalism. It's outright propaganda that we'd normally see in North Korea. And it's really crossed the line during this election campaign. It's given support to QAnon supporters, neo-Nazis, anti-vaxxers, virtually every unhinged player and bad seed in the community. And it's resulted in people calling for the assassination of Daniel Andrews, including members of the Victoria mm. Parliament. And mm. and it makes you think, well, where are they going to draw the line? And if the Labor Party does win the Victoria election, which is the more likely result based on all the opinion polling that we have at this mm. stage, it would just show that the media has failed again in trying to get the government of its choice. And if the Liberal National Coalition wins with all the bad players that it's got and with all the support of the extremist elements within the community, well, I think we'll just encourage the media to keep doing it again and again and again. And that's why I think there needs to be serious reform of the mainstream media, especially after what we've seen in Victoria over the past three years. Mm. And the most disappointing is elements of the ABC. Not Again, not all ABC journalists, but... We get loaded questions from journalists who should know better, from new shows that should know better. Turn on shows that are about balanced discussion and you've got three News Corp journalists, no independent journalists, a Fairfax journalist and the host from the ABC who used to be with Sky. Maybe some of you might know what show that is. And actually, I will name a show, Q&A. When it's got a good panel, it's compelling viewing. But so often it's got people who aren't very good and who shouldn't be there. And I know that TV producers think it's all about conflict and getting an instant reaction, but a great discussion from experts is so much better television than five know-nothings mouthing off hoping to get a bit more airtime than the one who just spoke. We need to totally reform the media landscape here. And this takes us back to we need a Royal Commission to see how that can be done. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can also donate to New Politics through Patreon. And please share, comment, or add a review. It helps other listeners find our podcast. And in the past on New Politics, we've reported on the court cases against David McBride and Richard Boyle. David McBride is being prosecuted over releasing details of war crimes committed by Australian troops in Afghanistan. And Richard Boyle is being prosecuted for releasing details about the aggressive and illegal debt collection practices of the Australian Taxation Office. And those cases are still going on. And it is interesting to note that the only people who have been charged in these circumstances are the whistleblowers, not the perpetrators of the original crimes. Now, These cases against David McBride and Richard Boyle, they actually commenced some time ago under the coalition government. The new Attorney-General, Mark Dreyfus, he said that a Labor government would review these cases. The Attorney-General did drop the charges against Bernard Caleri in the East Timor spying case, but these two other cases are still ongoing. And 
What's not understood is that the two most powerful politicians in Australia are the Home Affairs Minister and the Attorney General. They've got more discretionary powers than even the Prime Minister has. And the Attorney General could use the powers contained within the Judiciary Act to stop these cases immediately, in the same way that he dropped the case against Bernard Killary. Now, there might be all sorts of matters relating to precedent, unintended legal consequences that the Attorney General wants to avoid. I can't see what those would be, though. But both of these cases have been going on for too long. Mark Dreyfus could drop these charges today if he wanted to, and as he did in the case against Bernard Killary, and that's exactly what he should do now. Again, uh, Richard Boyle and David McBride should also have their charges dropped and be exonerated. Yes, it's difficult. They worked for an organisation that did this stuff and they were under orders and they were following what was ostensibly legal action, etc., etc. But it was wrong and we were right to know this type of stuff. Now, they could let them go and then put in extra laws that prevent this type of stuff or better yet, put in a procedure that you don't have to go to the media to complain about this type of stuff. An independent board saying, well, this happened and it shouldn't have. And the independent board says you're right or you're wrong, depending on the circumstances. And it can all be kept away from the media till a decision's made. And I know that there's problems about discussing this stuff in private, but whistleblowers need to be protected too. So to be able to make an anonymous or at least a secret claim that can be weighed properly and discussed properly away from the glare of the media and then reported on seems to me to be a much better way. And that's, this is what they should be working towards. So you let the other two go, essentially let them go and rebuild again. Whether the Labor Party have the will to do this, whether there's the support in the various departments and agencies as well. Having certain workforces running under some kind of fear works to the advantages of less scrupulous behaviour, shall we say. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where Dreyfus goes with this. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. If you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.